uh, for today's episode, we're giving you another Netflix original movie that is another flagrant, absolute, just begging for an Oscar for this year. I'm talking, of course, about Hillbilly Elegy. And to do this, to do a deep dive into the world of Hillbilly Elegy and J.D. Vance, uh, we've brought along, of course, Matt and Amber. But finally, long time coming, been chefing this up in the kitchen for a while, we are joined by, of course, the experts on all things Trill and Hill, the Trillbillies, Tom and Terrence. What's going on, fellas? Thanks for having us, Sean. This is great. Just uh, sitting in Appalachia. (laughs) Well, okay. Guys, I, I just want to kick things off. I mean, obviously, I wanted to have you know a couple a couple Kentucky boys on to bring some like some some real some real juice, some real knowledge to this film about you know Appalachian life. Uh, but then I found out that probably less than five minutes of this movie actually takes place in Kentucky. So I don't know I don't know why you guys are here. Can we get Murder Brian on the line, <laughs> or, or just Chris? He's from Southern <laughs> Southern Ohio. Ninety five. Yeah, you got you got Chris in middle t- Middletown, Ohio. I got Chris, of course, Matt lived in Cincinnati for a little bit. Uh, Chris is from South Ohio and, you know, Amber from Indiana. So let me just start with Amber and the Trillbillies boys. Um, having seen this movie now, I mean, just what's, what is your, uh, how do you think this captured the, the culture of Appalachia and the holler? He's like as Appalachian as me. Like literally he spent. <laughs> Well, he has like one summer that he or spent there or something, which is very common. But like, it's very common. Okay, so there are two types of Midwesterners, and this is not a Chris Rock bit. But I think <laughs> I think Matt will back me up on this. There's like North Country people, and then there's like people who come from Appalachian transplants that came in during you know industrial. The butternuts. Yes. Yeah. So I am from butternuts. So I have my entire father's family are all from Kentucky and they you know they moved to towns with other people from Kentucky and Tennessee to work in a paper mill or whatever um but I would never say I'm Appalachian like despite having spent like a lot of time there I really feel like he's stealing a little bit of valor he is stealing as much valor as all the kids I know who went to Marquette who went to the private Jesuit college in Marquette, in Milwaukee, who said they were from Chicago. Yeah. They were all from fucking Schaumburg. <laughs> Disgusting. And fucking, uh, 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 Aurora. Disgusting. It's, just, it's like, yeah, I'm from Chicago. Yeah, yeah, right. You live next to a shaky. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, there, there was this thing, like, when I was in college, it was sort of considered dead class to be from the South or to be from Kentucky or whatever. And then, like, five or six years after I graduated, it started being cool. So those same girls that were, like, no, I'm not from Northern Kentucky. I'm from Cincinnati. All of a sudden, became these sort of dainty Southern ladies that like you know to drink <laughs> bourbon, and, like, watch college football, and shit. wearing a giant hat to the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just really got into. It. I I do like how in the very first though, like in the opening scenes, he gets his ass beat for being from Ohio. Yes, exactly. That's it's a real problem. <laughs> yeah. we don't talk about is anti-Ohio bigotry <laughs> among children. Uh, Midwestern bull- yeah, that is insane. The, the, also, if he's from the part of Ohio that I assume or that he insinuates that he's from, it is just the cusp. Like it's it's different culturally because there's manufacturing and stuff. But like like the, the person I was watching it with, he was like, like if we met someone from like 20 counties over, we would be like, huh, look at you, bumpkin. Please be my best friend. You're the most exotic person I have ever met. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're from a small place, like. New people are really exciting. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. for sure. Well, maybe they just recognized that this kid sucked. He did And they suck. were bullying him because he sucked. <laughs> because it cannot be stressed enough. This kid fucking sucks. Yeah. He's awful. He's a yes, selfish little yes, shit. Yes. Well, that's the amazing thing is you're supposed to root for this kid in his life to get out of there. But he exhibits no reason for you to root for him. He does nothing. He is in no for no moment does he sacrifice himself for anyone else. He doesn't show any uh, personality or spark or anything. It's just you're the audience, and so you identify with him, and so of course you're rooting for him because he's just he's you. He's a boring fucking dipshit like you are. Yeah. Well, just okay. A boring, he also selfish believes asshole. himself. Wait, Matt. He believes himself to be smart. He does this weird thing where he implies that he's smart because he's failing at school. And the teacher at one point pulls him aside and says, I know you're smarter than this, which is that's a lecture that teacher, I'm sure, gave 10 times a day. 
to various oh, sure. children. There yeah. was like nothing that just, indicated even that he was like smart and could excel. I just uh, my my letterbox review of Hillbilly Elegy was uh, Mima and Pep Pep uh, help use hill hill folk wisdom to help huge fat pussy get internship at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this movie is about. Yes, That's what this movie is about. Str- and I just like I the movie. I get the. I was just saying yes. This whole the whole conflict here is whether or not he's going to be frankly a shitty son. Leave behind his mother at what is just a heroin motel, which, by the way, he's surprised about. It's like yeah. okay, the place. The place has the yeah, lighting. Got, get to that. The lighting of a fucking you know Edward Hopper painting, so that he can go to an internship. This is just the story of a bad son. Yeah, how can you really trust a guy that won't piss clean for his mom? I mean, Jesus. <laughs> how, yeah. how, how is that even a question? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I want my mom to lose her job. You fucking little sicko because you can't take a piss? Yeah, and, and no sense of like, oh, also, my economic well-being is bound up with hers. <laughs> yeah. Just by, just by way of comparing this to uh, Trial of the Chicago 7, though. Unlike that movie, uh, th- th- this movie was is executive produced by J.D. Vance and directed by Ron Howard. So, I mean, like, Ron Howard uh, is just a very, very middling director. He's made some good movies, but he mostly oh, makes... Oh, God, movies. absolute fucking... Just sort of like paint by, paint by numbers, is, schlock. No talent hack. Yeah. And this is this is the worst kind of bad movie because it's it's offensively bad and like a number of reasons for a number of reasons that we'll get into. But at no point does like the utter catastrophe of the filmmaking or acting really get to the point of being fun or funny or like truly absurd or idiotic. It's just it's mind bogglingly dull. There is not a single moment of like tension. Like the like, as Amber explained, the entire fucking like engine of this movie is is this fucking Yale Law School asshole going to make his interview with the big firm? Get uh, spoiler alert, he does. There's no conflict. At no point is he like actually have to choose between his his family roots and like a career fucking I don't know, yeah, at the Heritage Foundation. But because this is about JD Vance, I just want to share uh, JD uh, hopped back on my radar recently. I mean, we've talked about his book when it came out. But he had a pretty fire tweet at the beginning of this month that I think helps sets <laughs> up, you know, the sort of mindset of the guy who made this fucking movie and book. Uh, he says here, as a parent of young children and a nationalist who worries about America's low fertility, re- I can say with confidence that daylight savings time reduces fertility by at least 10 percent. I mean, does this guy just like not like fucking when it's too dark out or too light out? I don't get it. <laughs> What's he on about? I mean, I'm going to take the counter on this and say that daylight saving sign is a scourge upon uh, our planet, and uh, we need to get rid of it. That's why it Indiana is. doesn't recognize it. You no, know, we fucking don't, because fuck you. That's why, also, we are an agricultural state, and it, we know that now they make the farm equipment with headlights on it. It doesn't matter if it's dark. It's got lights on it, right on the fucking thing. Just, just, it's going to. I think, like, like the the beginning, like the opening scene of this movie has like the funniest fucking part that like totally sets up everything that comes after it, and it opens up in Jackson, Kentucky, in 1999, and it opens with like there's a sort of a, a radio preacher in the background, and he's talking about how, you know, in this great and resplendent land of ours, some some feel that hope and prosperity is out of their reach, and like this is sort of. Uh, juxtaposed with images of sort of like toothless Mimas sitting on a porch and on a rocking chair listening to the radio. And then young JD, the sort of like uh, adolescent JD Vance, hops out, of the, uh, hops out of his grandma's house and bikes on down to the swimming hole. And then in voiceover narration of JD Vance in the present, he says, people ask me where I'm from and I say Ohio because that's where I'm from. But that's only part of my story. Uh, I also spent some time with my cousins in Kentucky, and that's where I feel the most at home. He spent like one summer vacation there, and by the way, I had to make a note to myself: there is not even cousin magic in this movie. It's just no his cousins. Parents, no he has that's even no lamer. Friends. It's not like he was wiling out with his cousins in the holler, going to the fishing hole. He was just alone by himself, being a huge pussy. And then he's at the swimming hole, and he's just like, this is where I feel most at home, here in the hollers of Kentucky. And the actual Kentucky kids, like, beat the shit out of him. They're like, you fucking pussy from a Yeah, it's like, where, where, where is this feeling home? <laughs> you know what? You don't so actually hold him feel under- home at there. That's why I realized this is the movie. At the, at the end of the movie, it's like, he's saying that because the narrative, it's a college admissions essay. Yes. 
Yeah. He's just trying yeah. to get into school. He's trying to impress the audience like they're the fucking uh they're the entrance exam board or the law school guy that he's going to the job interview for. It's like that's just part of my story. It's like, bitch, why do I care what's your fucking story? I don't know you. Yeah. Also, there's nothing at the end that suggests and that man grew up to Yeah. Nothing. To do anything, to write this book. He went that's to the, the military. He, yes, that was he, his accomplishment. He, his accomplishment is that he wrote about it. His, he, is a, he, is, he is worth caring about because he got a book published that somebody made a movie about. What, that's it. What, that's all what else was going on in Jackson, Kentucky, right around the same time? And, they, and like this is the thing that made it out. Fucking Steven Seagal was floating around doing fire down below, like, you know, <laughs> paying people money to like, let me blow up your fucking truck sitting in your yard, that kind of shit. Uh, next of Kin, I think, was Hell yes. down there with Patrick Swayze. Yeah. Hell yes. And Hell yes. Somewhere a young Sturgill Simpson was budding down there, but JD in the swimming hole is the thing that, you know, so <laughs> that's this what we need to care about. Is this dork getting purple nurpled so, by his cousin? <laughs> Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> So the real collar kids beat him up, and like this, this is the moment at four minutes eight seconds into the film in which my mind completely checked out. So it's like young JD is getting bullied by holler teens, and then old older JD in narration says, "Things can get pretty tough down in Jackson in a heartbeat, but Mama and Papa taught me that you never start a fight, but you always finish one." And then it just shows him getting his ass kicked again. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, my kinfolk says that even if you even if you lose a fight, your people will always back you up. And then the film shows his grandparents <laughs> saving him from getting beaten up and humiliated further, which is like the th this is this is the story of like J.D. Vance being a huge pussy like that. That is yeah. that is what this movie is about. Yeah. The dynamic Wait I found really weird and culturally inaccurate as well, J not just because like the bullying thing, but like. When they were shocked when uh, his papa like punched the kid, it's like none of my grandparents. Would. We're all just old people are just allowed to hit you. Like you are terrified of old people because they're not they are not bound by the laws of man past a certain age in Kentucky. They will just fucking hit you and no one cares. And it's like, what is this like? You know, chocolate war, wild man's land, like tyranny of like teen boys that supposedly exists there this is it was not believable was my point in some ways it was like the passion of jd like he just gets tormented and has yeah. his ass kicked throughout the entire thing yeah so I, and so i really did wonder like in the licensing for this book or yeah for like when he sold the rights to it if he had some sort of like clause in there or something that said like i have to be the protagonist it did like it didn't make sense when i saw the trailer for this movie I thought that it would be a drama between Amy Adams' character and Glenn Close's character. And I was like... Yeah, me right. too. Yeah. With, yeah, with JD as kind of an onlooker, as a sort of innocent bystander in the whole thing. But I was shocked as the movie progressed. Like, he's the main character, the most boring guy in yeah. the world. Yeah. Little but turd. It's Who weird. It's, about it, him? But they stripped out the politics of most of it. I mean, this, did, this movie did have an ideological message. It had an agenda. It was very subtle and very vague and even squishy in its own right. But... It, but by stripping out a lot of the politics of the book, they just left the characters. And so it just was disjointed. It was very bizarre. I don't know. I, I found it to be The very structure bizarre. is insane. Like it's, yeah. It's, it's this oh, the, 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 art of yeah. flashbacks within flashbacks with no narrative forward momentum at all. Oh, you I, lose I track know. of what's the going on, except that movie. they smear all of the, the uh, <laughs> flashbacks in sepia. Like but, literal sepia. That's how you yeah. know this is olden times. The, the sheen of this movie and like the color palette is exactly the same as Simple Jack from Tropic Thunder. <laughs> it's like it's the exact same fucking color palette. It really look. was. And I, I forget. Someone said it on Twitter. Someone said it on Twitter, and it's just, it's not an original thought, but like Glenn Close has been around for ages, and she's been like a god tier actor. Like you know, someone who is even if oh, the yeah. movie sucks is always good in. You know, and like this movie was her monkey's paw wish to win an Oscar where she's like, I, I just I need an Oscar this year. They gave it to a fucking British TV actress and I was supposed to win it for the wife. She's like, I'll do anything to get an Oscar. Monkey's paw curls. And she looks like some sort of like gnome smoking new Paul's Newports. <laughs> I got to say, though, the styling and the yeah. aging are yeah. the one thing that I have to give credit to. Like down to the glasses. My mama has those big fucking plastic pink lens crafter glasses. Uh, she, she was the only entertaining part of it. I would have yeah. watched an entire movie with just Glenn Close's yeah. mama. 
Yes. <laughs> Amber, you're right. You're right in like the 4X, like Walmart faded glory shirt over yeah, like, yeah. This, like the spandex waisted jeans. Everything. Everything. Yeah. And, and the yeah. perm because like never going to condition that hair, but can't miss a perm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's 100%. And there, you know, and, and, and the thing is like, uh, Terrence, you're right that the movie, the movie soft sells J.D. Vance's actual politics and the book was very political and like, it was very well reviewed, but like I don't think people should lose tr- sight of the fact that like this was sort of I guess what they call a literary memoir that was very well reviewed in places like the New York Times and elsewhere. <laughs> but the thing is like this this isn't just the story of some kid who like had a pr- semi fucked up childhood and like made good and is telling sort of an inspiring story. I mean, this guy is a dyed in the wool member of like a, a, a conservative legal movement and like he's ideologically driven in everything he does i mean he's on fox news every other night of the week like so i mean there's a political valence to all of this but like also just from a literary perspective i've been exposed to so many of these type of memoirs that i feel like i have a pretty good radar for what is literary exaggeration and i feel like there's a lot of it going on here where he's trying to make like his childhood and family life seem a lot more precarious and fucked up than I imagine it actually was. And like, you know, if we take it at face value, like, yeah, his, his home life was a little bit fucked up, but like in the grand scheme of things and the sort of tapestry of American life, is it that fucked up or crazy? So yeah, like I, I just think like we'll, we'll get into it, but like a, a lot of this in, in, in the book and the film felt like it's either he's exaggerating or like the stories he's telling just aren't that impressive. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah. uh, well, one time me and my friends uh, like got drunk and did some mild property damage. It's just yeah. like, well, I mean, okay, like no, it's all dork shit. It's like it's a nerd bitch, hall monitor nerd trying to make his childhood look interesting in any way. He yeah. shoplifted a calculator. <laughs> that was the best part. He, like, he, like he, the moment where he, like, he could have turned to a life of crime and like going to prison and shit is when he shoplifts the Texas Instruments calculator so he can do his fucking homework on time. No, there, this, this, this child was never going to be anything other than a pleated pant lanyard bitch. Like, it's born into him. Yeah. There's the, any attempt to try to make it look like, oh boy, it could have gone any way for old JD. It's like, no, it could not have. And and that was the essential thing about this movie is that like there there was no tension or feeling of uh, uh like drama or anything about this question of will young JD make it or not or will will adolescent or will like young man JD get the job at the law firm because it's like of course he fucking will like there there's no chance his life is going to turn out any differently 100% the little the first little like outburst he has at the dinner table did not happen <laughs> Yeah. About redneck? About the word redneck? We don't Yeah, use like word. he was so offended by the term redneck. Yeah. First, okay. Yeah, opening scene, he finds out his mother OD'd on heroin, goes back to the table, is like, well, I better finish this dinner. This is for me. I better rub elbows. Because he's a piece of shit, by the way. And then all of a sudden, he, he has really this is. weird kind of like national pride. And he's like, we don't use that word. Yes, we do. Do everyone yeah. use it? Like cops is on bumper stickers. Right. There's not even a generation of people for whom redneck is some kind of a slur. <laughs> very weird. Yeah. So like like er, like early in the movie, like it, it, it jumps forward in time, and it's now 2011. We get we get a little we get a little snatch of a young JD in the holler back in 1997 in the fire down below era. And then it jumps ahead 14 years in the future. And, you know, JD, he's grown up. He's a hard worker. He's a slop jockey by night at a local restaurant to pay for Yale Law School by day. And he says the road to Yale Law is rocky, but there's only one way through. So like, he's already this hyper ambitious guy and he's got a girlfriend and he's got like a he's on his way to a career in D.C. And then so he's going to this like Yale Law School event where you're supposed to like, yeah, rub elbows with all these partners at a firm to get you an internship, to get you on the way. Uh, climb that ladder on the road to success and he's just like i think he really plays up the idea that like they all there's two different kinds of white wine and he's just like y'all i don't even know about this y'all got mountain dew or something and he's all like freaked (laughs) out because like he doesn't know what forks to use and i'm just saying like i don't i just i don't find it credible that he could have gotten all the way to yell he's Uh, he's and He's been lying. that fucking like perplexed by like a wine selection. Why are there so many fucking forks, Usha? If he was that perplexed by that shit, he wouldn't have He's been in that position. He's lying in such a way that is intended to appeal to like p- 
pitying liberal audiences because he knows it's what they want to hear. It's this Just horrible like they want to hear him get offended thing. by redneck. Yeah, it's they want to hear him be like, "No, that's my lived identity. You can't say that word." Yeah, that's because we want to hear. It's the same thing as <laughs> I, I bring this up every time, but like the arugula thing when like Barack Obama had arugula and it was like on a, in a salad or a sandwich or something, and then on Fox News people were like. Uh, arugula uh, is middle america really going to elect an arugula eater and it's like we know what lettuce is <laughs> we've heard of lettuce <laughs> like it drives home at every point just how backwards he is but it doesn't work i don't know it, maybe it's because of the actor they got or because it's just false as you said will like it's just literary embellishment but they're just constantly driving that home like the fork thing you know what i mean like it was just um Honestly, the movie is about a guy whose disability is that his grandparents are Appalachian. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's yes. It. Oh yes. my God! Does this mean I have, I have a disability? I, can I start talking about spoons now? Yeah, you, everybody you, you get extra time on your spoons. SATs to be a fucking hillbilly. <laughs> yeah. You, nobody. You can't just be a regular white person because that means you're bad. Yeah. So in order to get audience buy-in, you have to be some subcategory. Yeah. That has been oppressed, An even if you white. didn't personally suffer any of the oppression. Right. Like yeah. when he had, yeah. I bet that he did have that meeting, and I bet he noticed the wines, and I bet he noticed the forks. And you know what he probably thought? He thought, wow, I bet the hillbillies I grew up with would be baffled yes. by this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He would say, yes. he would he say my mamma like and papa wouldn't by. know how to, exactly. know what to do. But that doesn't give him like a little narrative arc, a little emotional thing of like, and something to overcome. So he makes it like he was actually intimidated by it <laughs> and not just imagining what his relatives would have thought. Right, right. So as, as Amber pointed out, he's, he's, at this, he's at this posh Yale Law dinner and he gets a phone call from his sister. By the way, the sister, they totally went, we want a Jennifer Lawrence type. Also, the sister, yeah. there's a weird, I, I don't mean, Tom, Tom texted me this afterwards and we were talking about this. There's, there's almost kind of a weird sexual thing between him and his sister at, some, at several points. They're looking at each other like, I, I mean, I, I know that that oh, probably t- wasn't. Terrence, another stereotype. Another stereotype. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> well, they didn't really have the, uh, the, the his actual love interest. It, it didn't really um, sparkle. She was just like this very like beautiful kind of woman who no. would, uh, you know, answer the phone and then hold it uh, like, six inches from her face so that it didn't obscure her perfect bone structure or whatever. Right. You didn't care about his future wife at all, but you did care about the sister. No, not the slightest. Type. Well, his right. sister, the, the, the girlfriend stands in for the life that he's pursuing. You know, this put together cosmopolitan lady yeah. from outside the hauler right. who, who, who she's trying to impre- impress and keep interested in him. And she just, she represents the whole world that he's, searching for and you're supposed to think she's cool because that's what he wants he's boring. But once again why should i care about this turd <laughs> or be and him being with this boring lady yeah this boring uh the, the, the lady from a crate and barrel commercial there was that one weird scene where he's like at the barbecue or something in in metal town and she calls and he's like my mom's od'd again and she's like oh can i come like help out or something and he just gets weirdly aggressive with her like yeah you wouldn't fucking under like just like just like preemptive like, you wouldn't fucking understand <laughs> also i feel like i mean maybe this is projecting myself but i feel like everyone has had a family like having a family member with an addiction problem is not like a super rare thing right <laughs> anywhere <laughs> kind of anywhere yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're rich, it's benzos, and if you're poor, it's like heroin or meth. Like, so he's at this posh Yale law dinner, and he gets a call from his sister that his mom just OD'd on heroin, and he's like, "Oh, but it's job interview week. Oh, do I have to come home?" And she's like, "Well, yeah, your your mom almost your died. Mom she's back on snacks. So, <laughs> and then he's like, "Oh God, how am I going to think about the forks now?" And then he he goes back and sits down. And then, like, then you get the scene where, like, one of the law partners is like, well, you're from Appalachia. What's it like to go back and talk to all those rednecks? And he's like, uh, we, 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 don't, we don't use that term anymore, which was <laughs> such absolute bullshit. But, then, bullshit. I, but then, it gets to, then it gets to what it was my, a, one of my, abso, my absolute favorite line in the movie is, like, he's, he's sort of being pseudo-interviewed at this dinner. And they're like, so, uh, J.D., like, tell us about yourself. And he goes, well, you know, like, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Kentucky, but actually Ohio. And then he goes... And then I joined the Marines and served in Iraq. Quote, it was a great experience. 
That's what it really? was. Was it? It wasn't the million dead. It was a good, it was a resume building opportunity. It was a chance for personal growth for me, the fat, disgusting center of the universe. But Matt, this is why you are absolutely correct in that this whole movie or the whole book was based on a call like it's it, a developed yep, college admissions it, essay where it's like yep. I, it was an amazing experience. I met lots of interesting people and learned a lot. <laughs> That's why I you should them. consider me for this internship. But yep. another friend brought up a thing and uh, you can tell me if you agree with this or not, but one of the ways that this doesn't actually translate is that, okay, so the book was intended for a bunch of liberals that want a kind of, um, you know, a, a bootstraps hillbilly archetype to say like, look, well, he did it, so the rest of yeah. them should really get off their asses. The movie exactly. had the tone of like some of the more expensive like Christian family dramas or yeah. like a Hallmark movie. So it's for a totally different audience. So it feels really weird with that stuff jammed in there. Well, Because the movie was made for someone like my mama. You're right. Yeah. It was the movie was very strange as filmmaking. It is very like it's almost like they tried to do too much. There's two films here. There's what I call the Garden State plot, where he has to go back home, and it's even a rom com kind of because there's a scene at the yeah. end where with like, no shows rom or it. com, but yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. There's that, and that whole that whole sequence in the movie, fifty percent of the movie is this whole sequence. It all occurs in twenty four hours. I, I mean, like I I didn't even think about this until yep. afterwards. But this is everything that JD does in twenty four hours. Drives yeah. to Ohio, goes to visit his mom in the hospital. Goes to a barbecue where he sort of has the weird sexual thing with his sister. Takes his mom to rehab, which fails. Takes his mom to get her shit from Ray's house and then almost, you know, uh, Again. kicks his ass. <laughs> Ray right, was right. Ready, ready to come with it. <laughs> yeah. Goes and visits his sister at Payless Shoes. Takes his mom to a hotel where she tries to shoot um, up. And then he and then he just of fucking lets her cold turkey withdraw. For. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then... And then drives back to New Haven, does the weird rom-com thing, and then makes... I mean, like, think of all the movies and TV shows you've seen that occur in 24 hours. You know what I mean? Like, there's there's a pace, and there's a, a feeling that you're in the there's morning, the afternoon. Exactly. Yeah. You know that you're in the nighttime now, and, like, is he going to make it? What's going to happen? It was just, like, yeah. the way Why it did... whipsawed back and forth, it was just so disjointed. Why didn't they start out that way, either, is the other thing that I was thinking. I'm like, what if they just started out with, like, I have 24 hours... To get to this, you know, interview. Yeah, because at least then cut out be all the other and then, shit, and then backtrack to like backtrack to like here's what happened. Here's where I am. I'm this way, you know, and then just keep going back to him in the car being tense. Ha develop some conflict, some tension, because the entire time I was like, why do what's where's the conflict? Yeah, it, it's so insanely inertial. It's like there's no forward <laughs> narrative momentum. It's no. stunning. No, because, yeah, yeah no. you could have done this thing, 24-hour clock at the beginning, boom, set the stakes. He's got to get his mom. And then you uh, periodically have flashbacks over the course of it. Instead, it's just the, the, the flashbacks are, are put in equally with the actual narrative, so there's no sense of anything. It's all happening no. simultaneously. Who directed, like being, who directed was Crank? Was stuck in time like Philly Pilgrim. Who directed Crank? <laughs> or uh, Shoot yes, Up? Neville, uh, Neville <laughs> Taylor. Taylor. Or the sad Neville Dean and Taylor. Yes. Right, have right. to like go around a bunch of like fent heads and jug hooters as like Howard Ratner <laughs> or, getting your uh, <laughs> or, OD'ing mom to a uh, to her uh, to the halfway house. Or even if this had been my if this had been my cinematic vision, I would have went Warriors trying to get to Coney Island. <laughs> yeah, Coney Island is Middletown, <laughs> and like in New Jersey, when he's at that gas station, you run into the Italian mafia and they like rough him up a little yeah. bit there at the gas station. <laughs> then. He's got to keep going, though. If there are avenues they could have taken for I'm us imagining... to at least have some tension and speed and movement. I'm imagining the TV show 24 where it's like what you're about to see takes place in real time. JD has 24 <laughs> hours to stop his mom from doing heroin again before getting back for a law firm interview. <laughs> oh, no, he dropped her off at the heroin motel. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which again, yeah. even the sister says, yeah, well, there's a motel. The she motel sometimes he drops stays at. Why do you think she stays there? Oh, she Not has this guy who takes care of her named Amber. Bobo. He wears a big purple suit. Like, fuck. Not just the heroin hotel. He flushes her drugs and lets her withdraw just cold turkey. Just yeah. like, fuck. Sorry, That's mom. That's not dangerous. Yeah. That'll be fine. <laughs> well, and, and he, yeah. they, be the back, he even had the, the option there. of getting methadone on the way out of the fucking. Like, also, most people do, like, leave heroin, like, like outpatient treatment. Like, they come in, they have the therapy, they get their methadone, they go home. 
Like, what they actually need is someone to watch them while they feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> they could take care of them this, and make sure they don't very, do heroin again. Maybe we can talk about this later, but I thought that scene was very fascinating. I mean, there's a lot about the movie in that scene. Well, we'll get there. But, like, as Matt alluded to, like, the movie is trapped in this incredibly led in like narrative architecture where it just flits back between like an a plot which is young jd being like a big fat pussy while well, an unstable mother <laughs> and like a grandmother who takes care of him and then like and then the b plot of like young man jd spending one day in middletown ohio um but like you know we, we get some flashbacks of like you know amy adams we get like hints of her being unstable which is basically her freaking out after JD like cl- like is like knocks something over like a big dumb klutz. First he breaks some Easter eggs, then he knocks over some like a tray of football cards, yeah. and then she has a meltdown where she like attacks him in the street. They're also all shocked every time she gets mad, and obviously it goes into like darker places. But it's like again, maybe this is a cultural difference. But like the first time she screams at him, people are like, "Mom!" or like. But parents scream at you. Like, that's what, that's, I mean, roughly 50% of parenting. Like, I, it was just like this very weird thing where it's like, what culturally completely separate from my experience, little microcosm, did you grow up in where, at least in the initial scenes, the early Amy Adams, the single mom who is under a lot of stress, doesn't snap once or twice a week and fucking yell at you. Yeah. And this people don't just go, fun. well, she'll, she'll get over it. She's but this movie is made by and for people who don't do that, who have been trained not to do that, and who see that as not like part of living in a stressful life, but as some sort of eruption of instability, bad manners, and trauma. And also, more importantly, they have to play up the trauma of this to make this guy's boring ass childhood some sort of battle over adversity. Yeah. Him, his mom yelling at him has to have to yeah. take a place of like surviving a school shooting because there is no actual drama <laughs> in his boring ass yeah. life. You're Very right. little yeah. bad Which was a straight line to heart, which was a straight line to Yale. He was a fucking nerd. He was a nerd. He was locked in from a, it's from the jump and he was going to end up where he ended up barring some sort of catastrophe which he avoided. So there's nothing really dramatic or interesting about his triumph over adversity they have to make it appear that way they have to give people in the scene uh, uh, signaling the audience that oh you should think this is a big deal it's the lifetime television for women version of tree of life yeah exactly which is a movie that actually makes does scenes that really feel like childhood memories. Yeah, yeah which Whereas are not every necessarily scene traumatizing, in this just is another assembled, yeah. piece of hallmark bullshit. Every, every childhood well, scene Every childhood scene is a parable. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. pretty much every one of them, anyways, ends with some sort of moral lesson, whether it's because the, yeah. he's telling them to his fucking admissions ad- uh, counselor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that this is you said somebody said it was like this is like a, one of those Christian movies, like one of those movies where uh, yeah. you know Kurt feature Cameron, films for families uh, or something uh, arises over his pornography addiction, <laughs> and it is it is a Christian <laughs> m- mainstream film where Jesus is replaced with a job with a law firm. Like that's the thing that <laughs> redeems you from from the horrors of your life and and, and your uh, your travails is the hope of a nice fat upper middle class or uh, rich existence yeah, instead of Jesus. Yeah. You know what I found right. weird too, and we might be digressing too much. There's virtually no mention whatsoever of religion. Right. Which yeah, that's true because it's been replaced by ambition. And also, yes, he converted to Catholicism for professional reasons, basically to get in with like the fucking first things crowd, and the it like in his thirties or something. And it's like you're not going to mention like I I find it incredibly hard to believe that anyone with a mama and papa doesn't have some pretty formative church stories. Well, he doesn't believe in any of that. It doesn't register with him. It's not what matters. What matters is selling himself to the people on the East Coast he's trying to impress and ingratiate himself with. Yeah. So yeah. what does religion have to do with that? What do they care about religion? Because he knows they find it, at best, a charming rural eccentricity, if not like a, a, a moral uh, uh, deformation. And for him, it means nothing because none of it abs- adhered to him. Mm. So, you know, like you said, like there, there, there's a scene where uh, he does car pranks with his mom 
And then she like swats him. <laughs> she's like, you know, shut up, you little bastard. She and calls he him a little fat ass, like, which is the funniest. I actually doubled over. There's oh, nothing funnier. Oh, she starts beating him up and calling him like, fat. You little I'm fat ass. That's the like best calling scene in the movie. your tubby little male child a fat ass is the funniest. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I, I'm not endorsing it. It's I'm just saying it was hilarious, and it was the only time during the movie I laughed. Uh, there's one other part that so, I yeah. laughed at that we'll talk about later. So, uh, so like, yeah, his, his mom swats him in the backseat of the car, and then he, like, jumps out of a moving car and, like, runs into the nearest house, and he's like, my mom is trying to kill me. My mom is trying to kill me. And then the cops show up, and they're like, ma'am, ma'am, step away from the large son. Step away from your round boy. <laughs> and then, like, they put her in the squad car, and then it's just like, y'all are brutal. Uh, we, have, we, have uh, we have a 452 Caleb situation. Uh, please back up. <laughs> Four alarm Caleb situation. So, you know, it's like it's all like, oh, will you get the internship or not? And the, here's here's another thing that I don't know if you guys clocked. Young JD at several points in this movie really is into watching CNN. And like he's like, Grandma, yes, don't turn off yes. the TV. I want to yeah. hear Al Gore. I'm, I'm listening to Al, so I'm his, listening there, to Al scene, Gore. Th- yeah, he wants to he wants to hear Al Gore and Monica Lewinsky on TV. There's a scene where him and Glenn Close, his mama, they're chilling in the living room. And she's watching Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And this little bitch is like, can we put on Meet the Press? And then his <laughs> mama was like, no, I love Arnold. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? And this then is, she this says, is, this is the thing, never put a better, better has, movie in your movie. Whole, like, life, exactly, never put a better movie in a bad movie. But then like Glenn Close explains to him that she has this whole half-baked life philosophy based around Terminator 2, where she's like, uh, you can either be a good Terminator, a bad Terminator, or a neutral Terminator. And I was like, what? <laughs> but, but wait, what? There That's are no like neutral also, Terminators. But also, sometimes you become a different Terminator, and you can be a different type of Terminator on a day-to-day basis. You can change. So, so really, they're, they're really well, actually, uh, we live in a morally nothing. gray world. So I don't know why the Terminators are really necessary for this. That's almost like, like I'm sorry, the moral framework. Dog, wolf uh, thing from uh, American Sniper, but instead it's like, so you got your wolves and your sheepdogs and your sheep. Sometimes the sheep can turn into a wolf. And sometimes the wolves will become sheep. And the thing about the sheepdog is he's always going to be a sheepdog, but on a weekend, sometimes he turns into a wolf. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, by the way, I just want to say Al Gore is more of an actual redneck than J.D. Vance. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. But, I mean, yeah, like, the, the moral universe of the Terminators are that, like, you can either be a good Terminator or a bad Terminator, and that's pretty much set. Once you're on that track, there's no variation there. It's not like Papa was sometimes he was a bad Terminator, but then sometimes he helped John Connor. It's like, no, you're either, you're either good or a bad you're Terminator. You're operating from your programming, no matter what. Yeah. You're, being, you're, being, you're programmed. That's the whole thing about Terminators. Yeah. They don't get to choose. Yeah, there's some confusing Calvinist mix-ups here about, like, you're set in stone, but also there's bootstraps, but also the, it's just a... Oh, it's, it's completely incoherent in that regard. There's several different, like, one of the, you know, vignettes, the parable of the end, the mamma looks at JD and says, um, family's the only thing worth the goddamn. But then, like, you know, again, I'm jumping ahead, but, like, towards the end, he basically tells his family to fuck off. I, I don't know, it just, it, it never yeah. can land on... What well, really family means. matters to the extent that you can use it to get into Yale and to get <laughs> yes. the internship. <laughs> yes. That's what fam- right. that's why family matters because it's grist for the mill of your personal fucking ambition. Yeah. And to right. start and to start a new one with a woman who uh, you can be ashamed of your old one with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can improve on. Hey, look, I, I me and my cheekbone wife and our our little well-behaved uh, non-fat children I uh, have no, I've solved seen, the f- the family problem. I've seen his kids. They they take after JT. <laughs> oh. She is really be- the- like both the actress and the 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 wife are actually like really beautiful. And there is sort of a like, how'd you manage that? I mean, whatever. I guess people just sort of like pair off in Yale or whatever. But yeah, uh, here's the thing that occurred to me. Like it, it, during the flashbacks, it's like uh, so uh, the the grandfather dies, and then they go to the funeral, and you see Amy Adams like pop a pill in in the car on the way to uh, the funeral, and then like the next scene, she's like stealing pills from her job as a nurse, and then putting on roller skates and just like careening through a burn unit like high as shit. <laughs> I assume and I was just, I was just too, in the movie like on there's no real. That's not how opioids work. You want to take a nap? You're not. I've never been roller skating opioids yeah. fucked up. She, so she gets fucked up on pills like really quickly and 
it just occurred to me that like you don't really see any like progression of her falling apart. It's just you see her pop a pill once, and then it's just like, oops, I got fired from my job at the hospital for fucking uh, doing doing a doing a grind on like a fucking ER bed when laughing my ass off. Oh, he he assassinates her character. And then in the present day, like a big part of the plot is like his mom not having insurance or being able to like get a bed in rehab or like seek drug treatment. And I just got to say, I'm really glad those experiences informed his later career working for the Heritage (laughs) Foundation or whatever he did in D.C. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And you know what? Like it it strikes me that a lot of the flashbacks like like Amber, you're right. It really does assassinate the character of his mother because like a lot of the plot is about how like he keeps flitting about from like boyfriend to boyfriend there's a new stepfather. There's a new guy in the picture every day. And a lot of it just struck me as like JD's like real anger and like rage at his mother for not being like the, the sort of like a, a perfect like, you know, nuclear family a home homemaker. And, you know, like it just it's just his anger at her for like having boyfriends and not having like a stable family background. But I will say um, when she does marry a guy from her job, uh, JD gets inaugurated into a world of cool kids. Yeah, because he has like a cool <laughs> stepbrother, and like the first thing his stepbrother does is like, first of all, his new stepdad has a framed poster of Casino by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, I saw so that. Yeah, awesome. yeah. His new stepdad is really nice to him too, and immediately welcoming. And he just lucked into a cool stepdad and a cool stepbrother. <clears throat> and instead of like being like, "Oh, cool," he's like irate or whatever, and he's like a square and a bummer. It sucks, man. He sucks so bad. And it's like his, his like his his new stepdad, and like you know th- this is played in the movie like it's fucking Oliver Twist or something. But like he's got a cool stepdad who grows weed, and they have video games and shit. So it's just like, well, what what more do you need to grow up in America? Not much. And then his new stepbrother is like, hey, you want to get high, man? And he's like, no, he'd rather watch CNN and then fuck up his mom's piss test. Okay, like he said, he says it's a gateway stuff? drug. Yeah, he says it's a gateway <laughs> drug. He calls it a gateway drug, little <laughs> fucking dork. But like, and whip it. Okay, he's so like, to whip it. Well, he should be. Those those should be. You get the death penalty for doing those. Um, but like, okay, so like you alluded to it earlier, Tom. But like, there's a whole thing where like his mom needs him to piss in a cup for his for her job, and like, did he smoke weed with his friend, and is that's why he didn't want to pee in the cup because he knew his piss would fuck up her test? Because like that's never resolved. He never admits to smoking weed with his stepbrother, nor and then he does give the piss. But then, like, I guess it doesn't come back dirty. So I guess he didn't smoke weed. Like, that was just never very well explained, the weed smoking aspect of this movie. Right. (laughs) But, like, a little bitch, like, even if I assume he had clean piss, he was like, no, I'm not going to pee in a cup for my mom so she can keep her job. Because I, I want to teach her a lesson about who do you think buys the fucking potato chips, you fat little shit. Right, right. <laughs> this is, you know, this is the thing about the book that is consistent with the movie. The book is basically just slandering his mother. And like the very first episode we ever did on our show, we just called it J.D. Vance is a snitch because that's all this book is. He's just laying out all of his family's dirty laundry and secrets. And but this does get into the politics of J.D. Vance. Um and, and this was, I think, preserved somewhat in the movie. I mean, he, he does share that sort of same view with Charles Murray. I mean, like, I was telling Tom this the other day. I was kind of doing some research. We, we had gone on Citations Needed, and, and we were talking about Hillbilly LG, and I was kind of doing some research, and I found this essay that Charles Murray wrote in the early 90s called The Coming White Underclass. It was published in yeah. the Wall Street Journal. And, I mean, and if you read that, essay it is like the seed of hilly hillbilly elegy what eventually came the memoir and the whole idea like he says it in there illegitimacy is the number one social problem of our time you know single white mothers basically and and he basically says that if you if you want to be a single white mother if you want to raise a child on your own you should be shunned from society and literally have your child he proposed cutting welfare to fund orphanages for the children of single mothers. I mean, like, so this, I think this gets into the... <laughs> Clinton kind of fell in line with that. Yeah, no, yeah. I think this is kind of the under... I think this is kind of the sort of subversive message, you know, like the kind of message at the root of both the book and, and maybe it's a little more subtle in the film. But basically, yeah, like single white mothers are the, you know, the epitome of just you know, social evil. <laughs> well, and you know what they did um, to, I mean, to my experience growing up when I wrote about this is that, like, they did, of course, have, like, tanth checks and all of these things that you could get if you, like myself, had a single teen mom um, and a single income. And then they transitioned away from that and transitioned towards child support enforcement laws. So, 
you had tons of men, and there was a big campaign against deadbeat dads. Yeah. yeah. And that did not distinguish between people who were like, mentally ill, people who couldn't get a job, people who wouldn't pay, because there's no way to distinguish between that. Because it's just, it's so much easier to be like, oh, you have to be a nuclear family and you have to be tied to this other person, no matter what their problems are forever, rather than just fund children's welfare broadly, universally. Every kid gets these resources and, and these checks and everything. Yeah. And like, it... It was it really spiked the prison population. I mean, my dad was in and out of jail all the time, like for shit like that. And it's like the only thing that it ended up doing was giving my mom another job, which was tracking down my dad yeah. to ask for money he may or may not have had at the right. moment. It yeah. didn't it doesn't work. Like Yeah, but it's cheaper. Have you considered that? Because you try <laughs> you get the money out of the dads instead of out of the the uh, the, the budget. So yeah. you save you save an item, a line item there. Yeah. So it's just smart. It's just smart, uh, smart policy making. <laughs> <laughs> so as things move along in a, a rather, uh, it's both a rapid clip, but what feels like it takes forever in the present day plot line, we get another flashback. And like, this is where it gets really embarrassing because it's like trying to show how, as we said earlier, JD's life could have taken another path. You know, he falls into with the bad crowd. And by the bad crowd, it's just like a couple <laughs> teenage kids who like drink a beer. <laughs> And then they're like, hey, let's, let's go do some, let, let's go break into where I work and fuck up some shit. And he's like, okay, we can take my grandma's car. And like that, like that is the height of his like teenage misdeeds is like he, like, he fucks up his grandma's car doing some hijinks with his friends. And that's when Glenn Close, Mama Glenn Close is like, I'm taking you away from your mom. You know, you need a, you need a, a like a, a strong hand to guide your young male life. So I'm going to, you, you stop hanging out with those loser friends and start applying yourself. And then the, there's a funny scene where he's like on the front porch with his friends and like Mama rolls up and she does anti-Polish racism to him. Yeah. And she's like, oh, what's your name? What's your name? K Kowalski? Why don't you screw in a light bulb, you fucking Polak? And he's like, Ma, those are my friends. Yeah. yeah she's like, like you know, I'll, I'll you be know cold in the ground before a Polish person. There's a very good chance, uh, too, that she did say something uh We'll say ethnically insensitive, but it wasn't to a Polish person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, they, maybe they soft sold that part of it. But then there's a really there's a really amazing scene in the present day plot line. We're like, okay, his, his mom has like he, he's 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 pulled all the strings and gotten his mom a bed in this private rehab, and he's like maxed out all his credit cards to get her in there. And then she sees this and like she's offended by it because she doesn't want to feel I don't know in his debt or like a charity case to her to her dipshit asshole son. So she's like, nah, fuck this. I'm not going to rehab. And then he blows up at her, and she's like, just take me to Ray's house. You know, he's down by the Pioneer Chicken Stand. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then they, they get to Ray's house, and Ray is like chucking all of her shit out of the window. And he's like, fuck you, you junkie whore. Like, stay out of my shit. And then JD like gets his man up and he's like, what the fuck did you say to my mom? Why don't yeah. you fucking come down here and I'll kick your ass. It's in and his then blood. There's an, an amazing moment. It, yes. No, you always finish a fight. Always finish a fight. And then there's an amazing moment of like pure, pure literary exaggeration where like he runs into the dude's house and is banging on the door. And then the film cuts to show Ray behind the door, take out a knife and you're like, oh shit, it's about to go down. And then like, it just yeah. cuts and JD leaves and like just walks out of the house without the, even kicking the story in the door. there is like, that nothing it, happened. It just, that pure moment of invention, yeah, that pure moment of invention, just to give you like a little hint or indication that like his like oh this is some really dangerous fucked up shit that goes down in Middletown, Ohio. Just, <laughs> dude, that just happened. You don't know that guy had a knife behind the door. Shut the fuck up. So yeah, and then of course he has to drop up his mom at uh, the shooting gallery hotel, like the blinking light motel, <laughs> where he's just like, okay, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna drop my mom off at this seedy motel on the outskirts of town, and then it's like really shocked to find out that she goes out to cop and fix because it's like, yeah, no shit, yeah, she's addicted After to heroin. Like that's we you just leave her alone, as, yeah, yeah. As a hotel, she sometimes stays at. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. There's another really telling scene in this movie where it's just like in, in the, the A plot line of young, young JD, young fat boy. Uh, he, so he's like he's, he's on the cusp of like drinking beer with his friends or getting a good grades on his algebra test. And the moment that like really like 
sort of stains his soul and like fixes him on like the, the right hand path in his life is having to see his grandmother ask the meals for wheels guy for like meals on wheels guy for like an extra portion of dinner because like she's struggling and like that moment of his feeling of shame at like re receiving charity or just like playing Game Boy on the couch while his grandmother's struggling is what fixes him to like straighten up and fly right. And like, and I guess like that's the political aspect of this is like J.D. Vance, the, the man, the lesson he took from that was not that like people need more help to get by in their lives. It's that when you give people help, you shame them. And that yeah. like they, they should be like frightened, frightened into working harder. Like that's there's, his worldview. There's one moment when he's in the car with his mama and he's telling her, what, why do anything? Mom was salutatorian of her class and look what happened to her. And it's like, yeah, I mean, like, uh, this, I mean, it, it just perfectly shows that most people will come up against this reality and say, well, I guess I have two paths here. I can either work hard and work my way out of this, or perhaps the solutions are political. Perhaps I can join up with other people and we can challenge our circumstances. But this movie is not at all, you know, pushing that agenda. The agenda no, is yeah. very it much. is what it is. And, and yeah, what yeah. happened maybe between being salutatorian in high school and you sitting on the couch playing Game Boy? <laughs> Did she think maybe there were events in her life? Right. And maybe some things that happened before that, which we later find out, he barely, like, alludes to her fucking shitty childhood, something he doesn't find out until he's, like, an adult in college, which is, like, how <laughs> yeah. oblivious are you? Yeah. I, I got to say, too, he's really overrating the abilities of somebody that would be the salutatorian of Breath at County High School. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bobcats. <laughs> so yeah, and it's so like so 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 young young JD is so ashamed by having to see his grandmother like take charity that like he's like, all right, fuck this, time to hit the books. And I swear to God, there is an inspirational Rocky style montage of him just getting good grades. That was some of the wackest shit I've ever seen. And also seen. doing his dishes. Put on a it's movie. A, it's a Jordan Peterson scene. He cleans his yes. room. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he does. No, but it's just like, he's like, you know, getting strong now. And then like the big culmination of it is like, mama, I got the best score on the algebra test of, out of anyone in my class. And then it's just like, JD, your life has changed. You're good now. <laughs> <laughs> Not like your piece of shit mom. <laughs> you follow the rules. You did the good on the tests. Yeah. Now you get your reward. You get your sugar cubes. Who, by the way, uh, saw me set Papa on fire as a little girl locked in a <laughs> which, closet. That which was the other thing I laughed at. With <laughs> that was the other scene I laughed at because the yeah. way they shot it. Yeah. <laughs> With him like just falling <laughs> off of the couch and just be like, oh, oh, oh boy, oh, I'm on fire. And it, it, it tickled me. Uh, I thought it was pretty. It was supposed to be very traumatic, but I was like, okay, that's kind of funny. Come on. Just set the so dude on like, fire. Like, that's a hell of an escalation. <laughs> yeah. So this is like, yeah, this is like the last 20 minutes of the movie. And I started like, like noting for myself, like, what are the climactic movie moments here? What is the climax of this movie? And there, there's, two, there's two moments. In the young JD plot, the climax of the movie is him throwing a Texas Instruments calculator out of a moving car. That's it. <laughs> and it, and his, his mama is like, I bought you that calculator. You better hope it's not broken. And then that's when she gives him the, like a heart to heart, like come to Jesus moment about like, do you want to be someone, JD, or do you want to be on welfare? And he's like, okay, I'll go get the calculator. And, like, and, and that's it. And then the yeah. other climactic moment is after he's like squirted his mom's fix down the toilet, he's like, I really hope you get better. Bye. Just oh, dry out yes. 10 hours. Back like, I, fucking I want you to get better. Have fun vomiting for the next fucking yeah. like 48 hours and having the shakes and sweating yourself dehydrated while no one is around you. Except you do know that you, I do know that you can get a heroin here and they'll definitely uh, give you a deal for something. Yeah, Jesus, that's dark. That is, like, yeah. is it just it like it's dark? As, as as like a guy in his twenties, as a guy in his twenties, as a guy in his twenties, he still thinks like pot is a gateway drug, and that like if you just stop someone from doing heroin, like like that'll that'll save them. As long as you just get rid of their heroin but leave them in the exact same conditions that led them to do it in the first place. And it's like also she's as Amber pointed out. She's going to go through a withdrawal. She may die if she doesn't fucking fix yeah. up. 
So like yeah. maybe you should like get off your high horse and just sort of like help your mom. And like she's already like you know you can't get her into rehab. You know you just isn't have health insurance. So maybe just like try to make sure that she doesn't OD again. But just sort of accept the fact that when you have an addiction, it is something that like you cannot you cannot be reasoned out of or guilted At into like point, doing something yeah. better. At one point, he tries to pawn his mother off on his sister, who has children in the house, <laughs> as if he is not the most obvious fucking person. You know what? Take her with you. Put her in the fucking car. You got a long road trip. That's like, it's going to be unpleasant, but that's a pretty good way to keep like a, a withdrawing junkie occupied. And then you do your fucking interview. Just put up a little sign. Be like, my mom's Okay. Uh, the air conditioning is on. I cracked the window. Her she's favorite to her music favorite is music. on. Yeah. <laughs> and then just come back out. You know she probably can't. Like, take care of your mother. You, Amber. This is a story Amber, about hold on a minute. terrible values. You say this, but if he misses that interview for that internship, he'll have to wait two weeks to have another interview for a different internship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Like, that's the thing. Like, there's Amber. no stakes here. He, went, he graduated from Yale. He's there with the fancy people. He's in. It's just a matter of the job. This specific interview means nothing in a grand scheme, and he's willing to drop his fiending mom off at a Ramada Inn, basically, with a fucking uh, security guard so that he could go do it. He's a monster. Yeah. This entire, the entire, Amber. by the way, movie struck me as this is him internally justifying why he actually had to be a piece of shit son. Yep. And yeah. She had it coming. Yep. She had it yep. coming. He Absolutely. didn't even do a, a bad good mom. job. He didn't even do a good job of portraying uh, a uh, an addict family member as insufferably as they can be. Because let's be honest, they're not fun. It makes yeah. it really makes you not fun and unsympathetic. He didn't even like try and sell it as oh she was a monster she stole my shit she like physically attacked me like she was just a she was the best kind of sad junkie like where she was erratic and in pain and felt bad like that's the easiest kind to deal with <laughs> right? and yeah. he still couldn't fucking make time for her uh amber during that scene where like uh he's like he's trying to pawn his his withdrawal mother off on his, her, his sister who has a family i just had a note when i was watching it i was like Take her to the law interview. Drive her back to Connecticut. Uh, humorous hijinks will ensue. It'll be like a sitcom. You know, it's just like JD has a fancy law internship, but also a mom addicted to heroin. Wah, wah. What, 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 hey, what there's the, trauma what, sticks what forks in America, will she use? Momentum. That's a good idea. It would have made an amazing movie. A kind of, yeah. you know, mother. But he would have to care about someone can, else yes. for that to happen. Right. And yes. that can't happen. Yes. Well, this, once again, it just, why would you make a movie? Multiple times during this, I wish I could have like washed my brain of any knowledge of J.D. Vance and Hillbilly Elegy before I watched this because I would love to know what just a normal person with who has no pre knowledge of prior knowledge of any of this just watching this movie, they would have no idea what it's about. You have to know so much going yeah. into it, you know. It's like, what is the yeah. story here? I, I don't yeah. even understand. I mean, at the end, there's a montage of all of the parable you know all of the main points it's like if you're at that point in a film if you're on the editing floor and someone's telling you like i mean the only way for us to really in this is like you're gonna have to do a montage of all the, you know, <laughs> yeah. pivotal moments you know you, you just see ron howard just being like Fuck, all right i'll do it <laughs> like it's just like if you have to do that it's just uh, do you just did anyone see the the alexander pay movie nebraska oh yeah oh yeah so, Oh, great yeah, film. Yeah, be beautiful movie. And um, also, I, I like made my mom watch it because it's a great family comedy um, <laughs> that is also very dark. And you start out with these just uh, uh, abhorrent people and, and his parents, and he's trying to sort of figure them out. And then slowly you figure out why they are that way. And it's not a it's not a excuse. It's just an explanation. It's like you can't moralize that kind of like, trauma you just have to fucking grow up and know that you know there but for the grace of god this is someone who both like doesn't believe that there are reasons that someone is might be have problems or be like someone and two is completely disinterested in the reasons or that person's past or anything whatsoever like someone with no curiosity about his own mother or he throws in at the end that this one incident that she saw that he only knows about as an adult where her dad set or her mom set her dad on fire. Yeah. 
There's no environment in this film. None. There, yeah. I mean, like, no there, context. There, the only time they really interface with any world outside of theirs, I mean, there's that scene on the porch where he's trying, where his mom's trying to apologize, and then the neighbors are fighting next door, and she's like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, they're at it again." It's just like, yeah, that's one of the set only. Pieces. Yeah, that's one of the only times you even get any kind of environment. <laughs> like, so, like I said, like I was, I was trying to clock what are the climactic moments of this movie, and I already mentioned the scene where he throws a calculator out of the window. But the real climax of the movie is in the B plot, where where young man JD, after leaving his mother to withdraw in a seedy motel, makes the ten hour drive back to Connecticut to like get get to his law firm interview on time. And in the car ride back to Connecticut, he has like a, a fit, like he, he has a cell phone call with his girlfriend, who we only we only really see her in phone calls. And on the phone call, as he's driving, is the moment where he realizes like he's like. I just wish there was some way that people could know how much Mama meant to me. And that's like, ding! The climax of the movie is him getting the idea to write the book Hillbilly Elegy that would one day yep. be lauded <laughs> by thinkers, su- August thinkers such as Rod Dreher and David Brooks. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Who attempted his, uh, his baptism, by the way, when he converted to Catholicism. Okay, Amber, really though, how, how much of a real hillbilly can you be if you can stomach converting to vile Roman papacy? <laughs> whore, whore Babylon. Never, never. I remember when I first moved to New York and I had a boyfriend asking, he's like, what, what would your evangelical grandparents think about you dating a Jew? And I'm like, oh, they'd be fine with it. You're not Catholic. <laughs> That's right. this car drive contains one of the few overtly political moments in the film she's telling him like they're having this conversation in with his you know his fiance girlfriend or whatever she's like my fam my father had to come over here from pakistan or something you know and, and you're supposed to draw the parallel of her family coming over to this country and his family coming out of the mountains and into the civilized world and it is like i think what the message is, and it's reiterated at the very beginning in the mo- opening monologue, in the scene where he gets mad about Redneck, the, the guy saying Redneck, the guy goes, it's the American dream. And in this scene, I mean, it's just the most vapid message for a movie. I mean, like, could you uh, putting this movie out right now, you know what I mean? Like, quarter million people dead from a virus, food, you know, food bank lines tr- stretched around blocks. I mean... No, nope, nobody believes this. Nobody believes this. I mean, it's just like I don't know. It's just the most vapid pro-American movie you could you could imagine. And another thing I think is weird about the book and the movie is how that like the defining thing about being from Appalachia or whatever is like your relationship to coal, and especially a guy that would later become an AEI stooge. There's yeah. just like nothing about like anybody that was involved in the coal industry or anything like that. And I just think it's a weird omission to even engage Appalachia without engaging coal mining whatsoever. It comes up in the very first line too, where they're like, Oh, coal people. And he said, no manufacturing, which is interesting because like most Appalachians, like my family moved up specifically because they shut down coal mines. And it's even though it's like, that's when they got manufacturing jobs. That's like, because they were like, well, shit, we're fucked now. That's also when they stopped voting because there was no coal candidate. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So I just want to like, the, the final scene of the movie is just another snatch of his absolutely unbearable voiceover narration. And he's got his crisp suit. He's waiting in the, like, the lobby of the law firm and they're like, uh, J.D. Vance? And he's like, yes, sir, right this way. And he walks, he sort of strides into his job interview. And then like the voiceover narration, this is the last scene in the movie. To sum it all up is he basically just says, yeah, my family's not perfect, but whose is? The end. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, 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 like, here's how everyone's doing. His mom has apparently been clean for six years, and she doesn't get a redemption story or anything. She doesn't get credit for that or anything. This whole thing is just weird Oedipal anxieties. It's yeah. not about him loving his mamma. It's about him hating his mom. Yeah. Yes, that's exact. You're exactly right, Amber. And he like yeah. he deifies mama because she's not his mother, and like yeah. like she is. He's like she's the perfect woman that his mother like f- has failed in every way. And it's like you know the Glenn Close character. She's not so fucking perfect, and like nor does she like love him any less than his mom does. She's just maybe a little less unstable because she doesn't have to deal with drug addiction. But like. 
yeah, like no, the, the deification of Glenn Close is done entirely at the expense of Amy Adams and her character. Like she has to be dragged through the fucking mud to make Glenn Close's character seem like this this sainted hero of his life. Which also doesn't, again, there's like a cultural values thing here that isn't represented and maybe I'm, but like if I talked such garbage around my mother, around my mama who isn't even her mother, she would smack me in the back of the fucking head. Like there is yeah. a sense of like you, you have to, like the, your mother is the authority in this family and she loves you and she is doing her fucking best. In this thing where it shows, you know, all the photos of JD growing up and where everybody is now. It doesn't mention growing he, out. Yes. It doesn't <laughs> it, it doesn't <laughs> It doesn't mention that he's a venture capitalist. It just nope. says that he no. wrote this memoir. It doesn't say anything about him, like what he went on <laughs> like, himself. The guy yeah. that I was watching this just starts matters. going into it where he's like he's like, Yeah, uh y'all ever heard of Peter Thiel? Uh <laughs> I'm gonna gonna be one of his uh, venture capitalist investors when I grow up. I'm gonna invest in a company called Mithril. Uh, what them <laughs> nerds? It's from a J.R.R. Tolkien. There's a few references too where he has like Magic the Gathering cards. Like he was clearly like, yeah, 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 like, yeah, he's clearly yeah, like a yeah, nerd. yeah. But it's like yeah. if you try to explain his like success boss. in the business world, it's like you know building blood harvesting machines for <laughs> Peter Thiel's Blood Boys. Like that's your investment. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't matter what he's doing because, like, all these movies now, these type of movies, like, all I mean, all movies in a way, but this specific type, they are around reflecting the viewer. Like, J.D. Yeah. Vance is the viewer, so that means that his success is, of course, it's, it's taken for granted as what you're supposed to be rooting for because you're rooting for yourself. You're validating your own decisions in life. Yeah. And so just as it doesn't matter what you're doing because you're you, it doesn't matter what J.D. Vance is doing because you're supposed to relate to him because you're the kind of fucking anxious striver that he is. You're the one who has absorbed the same uh, uh, etiquette lessons and the same value system that he did and is pursuing the same life that he's doing at the same contemptuous uh, uh, distance from your family who only really slow you down and hinder you that he has. Yep, it's Hans Zimmer scored with fiddles. Literally. Yeah. No, yeah. yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I guess like the last question I want to ask you guys is, you know, but but the book was a huge sensation and it's probably like, you know, a lot was a lot better received than the movie, which has landed fairly tepidly. And the film does blunt the, you know, harder angles of J.D. Vance's like actual conservative ideology. But I guess I'm wondering, both the book and the movie, or the movie was made by Hollywood liberals, and the book was very rapturously reviewed by, you know, big city, like, newspaper and book review liberal types. And, like, yeah, yeah, it was, like, very, very much, like, adopted as, like, you know, this is an important book that everyone should read. And, like, whether it's the book or the movie, what do you, like, I mean, we touched on it briefly, but what do you think liberals see in a story like this that they feel is, like, they can adapt as sort of, part of their own or miss the sort of right wing uh, valence to all of this? Do they miss it or do they just like adopt it as their own? I guess is what I'm asking. I think what it is, is that uh, they are now able to, their discomfort with poor white people is that they don't have an oppression narrative that can contextualize their bad behavior that they are uh, uh, repelled by, but, but that they can't condemn, or at least they, they don't think they, they scold themselves for condemning because, well, you know, they don't know no better. But there's no narrative like they're white people like them. Other minor other people, their their oppression narrative exists. Their like lived experience narratives are out there that they could watch like and, and experience vicariously. Now they have a white version of that. Now they have like a white identity politics story of oppression to sort of contextualize the the regrettable behavior of of the underclass of the white persuasion. Well, it allows them to be um, the good white people and to think of themselves as the good, sophisticated, liberal white people and completely remove class from uh, the discussion because they're like, look, I like this one. He's one of the good ones. He, right, he exactly, did it right. which is the way that they treat all, sub so, uh, all oppressed groups, all, like, all, uh, all underclasses. Uh, the, they they tokenize them uh, and the, uh, by by absorbing these sort of narratives of success and striving, like uh, yes things are unfair, but 
what really matters is you you applying yourself and if you apply yourself you can succeed and the ones who don't it's too bad and you can talk about the things that make it harder for them to do it and that gives you a sense of sort of condescending uh understanding of them but at the end of the day they uh they can't be anything other than what they are and they're they're their failure to thrive is just the regrettable byproduct of their inability to rise to the moment the way that a uh, uh, apple cheek go getter like JD Vance does. Yeah, they can you two could succeed if you could just be a responsible adult and throw away your mother. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's correct. Uh, I think that me and Tom, we've talked a lot a bit about this on the show over the years. Um, but there has been a concerted effort in the last 15 15- I'd say 10, 15, 20 years or so to carve out this very specific like white ethnic identity of hillbilly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that like obviously like travel writers in the 19th century were, uh, you know, calling people that lived in the mountains hillbillies for their own specific class agendas and everything. But it seems to me now that they're they're doing this precisely because they can elide the class uh, structure of these places. So if you can just lump everybody into a hillbilly category, you can have rich, you can have poor hillbillies, but you can also have rich ones, and you can give Duck the dynasty, rich ones. Yeah, the yeah, bundies, yeah. 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 Or, I mean, yeah. like you see this a lot. I, you know, Tom and I have worked in the sort of NGO world for a while, the nonprofit world. You see people saying stuff like, "Don't define Appalachia by its poverty." Well, if you take that to its logical conclusion, then you're just going to start, you know, be like, "Oh, there's <laughs> rich people here too." I mean. Well, what yeah. do the rich people benefit from, and what are they? You know, what is their role in community? I don't know. It's just, it's a very yeah. Concerning it's thing. it's a bit also like when the libs got mad at Trump for saying like Haiti is a shithole country, and they're like Haiti is beautiful, and it's like yeah, Appalachia is beautiful, like especially the parts that haven't been like turned to mortar by mountaintop removal, <laughs> but like, <laughs> like. You know, se- the problem isn't that it's not celebrated enough for its beauty and culture and and people. The problem is that it is a shithole for a number of fucking terrible economic uh, reasons that have existed since, like, not just the closing of the mines, but, like, I don't know, the fucking Tennessee Valley Authority, which God knows they needed it. But, like, it's like people getting mad because someone said something rude, but not getting mad because a place has been like systematically exploited and treated as a third world within the first world for a very long time. And it's like, no, like the misery is the thing that jumps out at people. And like, that's not unreasonable. I think it's a function of the Democrats just completely abandoning a lot of these places. Like we had Mike Davis on the show this past week and he was talking oh, about nice. like, you know, you, 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 When's the last time you heard a Democrat talking about poverty or even Appalachia in general? I mean, just like they've completely abandoned these places. They've it's just- such a weird thing for the Democrats to punt on because Appalachia, I mean, it's something we talk about a lot. Appalachia was probably, arguably, the most reliable blue wall in the country until like Bush's second election. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Jim, Jimmy Carter won West Virginia against Reagan. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it hadn't been that long ago. Clinton won Kentucky twice. I mean, it's like... It's just such a such a strange. Uh, it's also I, an enormous region. Like it's yeah. it yeah. from oh, the yeah. north from the North Georgia woods to fucking Pennsylvania. Like it's it's this is a huge. There's also different cultures within it. Whatever. But oh yeah, like, no, it's it's massive. It's very funny though when you sort of press these people, uh, like the sort of liberals that I was talking about, who are invested in like this creation of this very certain kind of idea of an image of a hillbilly. It's like. If you were to actually press them on, are you talking about people in upstate New York? Because that's Appalachia too. I mean, they would absolutely say no. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's very weird. They mean Kentucky, which is also why he used Kentucky and didn't just say, I'm from the Appalachian part of Ohio, which is, I mean, yeah. like you go there, it's like, yeah, this is just everything from the accents to the way they, this is, the houses they get built and everything. But they needed the thing that pinged, so he had to talk about his, about Mama and Papa. Well, yeah. you know, back to the, Taking it back to the film, weirdly enough, I was, you know, like most people, was preparing to watch this and to sort of be bemused or whatever by the sort of stereotypes and representations. All that. this act, the movie actually kind of passed on that. It didn't like. I think you said this at the beginning. Will it spent like yeah, maybe really five did. minutes? Yeah, it spent like five minutes maybe on Appalachia, and then the, like it just kind of moved on. Here's some ignorant coal smudge reprobates, <laughs> but now back to our regular scheduled program. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's almost like they were too lazy to uh, put in the texture of offensive stereotypes. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. There was, I mean... Once again, I I find, I kind of feel like there's just too much to even cover in this. I mean, once again, I wonder like why keep the character of JD Vance? He's so unlikable. Did nobody sucks? Tell him? He's he awful. Sucks. Like why yeah. not take why not take so, if you're the screenwriter, why not take some artistic license and make an, you know, cast an actually likable main character or maybe he has a quirky best friend or something. You know what I mean? Like I don't know well, why they would he would have to he would have to look into his family and talk about them and like right. he does not seem interested in other people but like I don't know about his grandmother would but like my mama was one of nine and grew up without indoor plumbing or electricity that is a much more interesting story than I became a Brooklyn podcaster I, I like, had this it, yeah I had the yeah, same thought. Like, there's so many interesting people in the world, and we got a biopic on this guy? Yeah. This yeah. guy? Literally everyone in his family <laughs> has a more interesting story. I found myself being like, God, I wonder what the sister's up to. Yeah. Like, yeah. I wanted to know more about Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I just kept thinking of Ray from, you know, Twin Peaks. Just <laughs> a city guy living above a convenience store. It's classic. I was thinking about Ray from Vice Principals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love Ray. Shout out Shea Wiggum, the god. 